you all for coming to, I guess I should say this to the camera, the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Let us, we should go around the room and introduce ourselves. Have, do you want to start? Mm -hmm. Heather Simons, Department of Corrections. I'm here for Commissioner Menard. Um, and hi, I'm Karen Bastien. I work in the Commissioner's Office at the Department for Children and Families. David Chair, Assistant Attorney General. James Pepper, Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, Don Stevens, Chief of the Nolhegan Avenue Tribe. Jessica Brown, I'm um, one of the Attorney General Community Appointees, and I also work for the Public Defender Office. Rick Goth here, <clears throat> excuse me, Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Training Council. Lieutenant Gary Scott, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Commissioner Anderson for the Department of Public Safety. And I'm Eitan Ness, Red and Longo, the Chair. Pardon? Um, and on the phone. Oh, yes. Oh, and on the phone. I'm sorry. Rebecca, hi. Oh, hello. Introduce yourself. <laughs> it, it, is, it is Rebecca Turner, designee for the Defender General. Thank you. I appreciate you guys accommodating me. I can mostly hear. Oh, good. Okay. We'll talk loudly, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you all for turning up. Um, as I say, I think this may be a fairly short meeting because I, the discussion of reducing racial disparity, which we keep tabling, really is, um, at least in my view, it takes a lot of people to kind of have a good discussion about the various sections of the report that everybody was sort of going to take on and, and read. So, you know, if we have to table again, we will. I know that you had a, you, James, had a lot that you wanted to bring up about that report in particular. Oh, well, yes. I mean, we're okay. ready for that. That's well, I, we're going to be ready tonight, I think. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm hoping. Um, the only announcements that I have are regrets. The first is Major Jonas, who cannot be with us tonight. Oh, no, that was, that was the only one, because Rebecca's here in a virtual way. So, um... That's it. What about Sheila? Will Sheila be joining? Oh, I haven't heard from Sheila. Um, and I, um, let me make a final check of my email. They're also having a meeting. Um, I have no email from no Sheila team. at all, so I don't, I don't know. Um, but I think we should just get going. And Jeff. Yeah, I don't know where Jeff is. I haven't heard. I The only regrets that I have are from Major Jonas. Um, I What you have, what I handed out, um, the first, I at first let me apologize. I don't have access to a color printer, which makes that somewhat annoying. On the other hand, um, the first page after the agenda is from Chief Donstein. And he, you really can see what he did. The only thing that is perhaps not clear is about three quarters of the way down the first version is the comment from the word comment on is in red. I have, um, I have a copy just in case. Grand. People. If people, sure, if people want to see it in color. I'm sorry I don't, I, it didn't occur to me. Um, you preferred the first version, correct? The second page after the agenda is from, and I should say, I guess, in, in, in introducing this, I took the liberty of giving this also to Karen Richards, since she was so helpful to us in this discussion. Um, and she then sent this back to me, um, also in color. But she, um, her, her changes are all, uh, overstrikes and underlines, so in addition to the color, so you're not going to have as hard a time figuring what she said. Her email to me says she has a slight preference for the second version. So I think we have a fair amount to, to look at here. Um, I am hoping other people have other comments, concerns, and so on, and that I'm not going to hold forth the whole time. 
Jane? <laughs> I think uh, one thing that is important to note is that, uh, you know, Sheila was discussing a lot of frustration that she felt with the responsiveness of HRC in dealing with these issues. And I think that one thing that it might be good to note that it's really important to have these additional investigators to speed up the process so that the people that are the kind of victims of racial disparities in these cases that are being investigated feel like they're being attended tended to and that you know these six month periods you know maybe there's a way to speed up that, that uh, investigation period um, so you'd like to see some copy in here that's about and I'm happy to provide some language too I didn't get a chance but uh, uh, I think that you know if the legislature is going to take this seriously they might want to know why uh, we're asking for these additional staff members great um Sure, write it up. Sure. All that right. would be wonderful. Okay. Um, yeah, I, as I say, I just put this together as from the minutes and from my own notes from the last yeah. meeting and, and just, oh, I, I totally skipped over one of the important points because I'm not looking at the right agenda. But let's just keep going. We'll deal with the minutes later. Um, other, yes, Karen. So I, um, I liked what Chief did to the first version. Uh -huh. But one thing that Karen included in her version mm -hmm. that feels important is the restorative justice process. Yes, yes. So, and then also the coordinating outreach, education, and training. Um, and I think that speaks to Pepper's point, mm -hmm. actually, that the HRC is not really in a position to always respond to things unless it's really significant. Okay. And that I'm wondering, Pepper, if that could, if, if this role really is more expanded to include this other piece with the uh, coordinating outreach education as well as the restorative justice process, whether that will also help to meet the community members' frustrations that it's uh -huh. to respond and you can't always get a response unless there's something significant that's happened. Right. Okay. So that would just, I don't know if that can be incorporated, but I think they, we, we at DCF think they both look great. Okay. Um, great. But that would be great. So. I don't know. Just I'll, I'll take a stab at writing something and then circulate it. Great, yeah. great. You have the sort of the list of everybody and yeah, I'll apply all to what the chief sent. Okay, yeah. great. Um, this is going well. Other, other corrections, concerns, the issues. The only comment I had was just making sure that we have in whatever version we end up doing that we have the. Clearinghouse concept clearly stated. Um, I think my sense of the prior meetings was that was something that folks liked. It wasn't necessarily the case that HRC is going to do all of the investigations of every complaint, but that they are a repository that can at least be a data source for complaints. right. And they were going to direct things <laughs> to traffic cop type right. of position. Also, that's probably not the best analogy, but the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Works, <laughs> <laughs> but the but yeah, having them be a, a, a clearinghouse and a direction and a sort of data holding. Okay. And you do have that in the second one. I just think yes, whichever whatever version is final, it's important to have that. In okay. There. Okay. Um, anybody else? I'm making notes. Wow. Um, then, oh, geez. Oh, no, I just wanted to check to see if Karen striked out what I also suggested that we want to make sure to take out the word race related. She did, okay, I good. think. Because um, apparently she, that was one of the problems we had with the systemic racism right. panel is that it shouldn't be based on race, it should be based on qualifications. Well, if I'm looking kind of, at, so. If, so this second page that you provided to us tonight Karen. is Karen's. Yes. And so in the, in the first version, she didn't strike race related, but it looks like she added and other cases. Is that, am I reading that? Am I understanding that correctly? Did she add, did she add the parts that are underlined? Yes, she Karen. added the right. parts that are underlined and then struck out. Okay. Um, right. okay. So she, didn't strike race related. She add she added, and other cases. Uh, she was. That being said, it was also clear that the Human Rights Commission, as it is presently constituted, is not adequately staffed to handle 
an increase in race related and other cases. So she didn't. Oh, if I'm, if no. I'm interpreting that correctly. And it's also right. it says race based lower down as well that she added. I think where her comment was is that she couldn't specifically assign one person to race related. They had to spread it over all of them because that would then be some sort of bias because they were getting preference. Race, pe racial issues would get preference. So I think she said she yeah. had to spread it over all of the investigators and couldn't specifically design one person to handle just those cases. She, right? I yeah. Think that was the, she writes here, um, the panel believes in agreement with the HRC that one to two additional positions are needed to prioritize race-related outreach and the anticipated increase in race-based cases. And that would seem to support what you're saying in terms of what she was viewing. Um, Race-related being not given to one person in, in particular. Um, David, my, I, she actually has, in, in the first version, act as a clearinghouse. She's even got your language. Oh, great. Okay. Finally, and again in conjunction with the HRC, the panel recommends that the HRC act as a clearinghouse to direct complaints to the appropriate state agencies that may have their own complaint processes based on guidelines developed by the HRC. Um, they would also follow up on the outcomes of these referred to. That's already there. But is that our Yeah, sufficient? that's right. That's what I was hoping okay. to have in there. Okay. I think just a comment on the race related issue. But my understanding of the law, which is basic on this area, you is that. that you can certainly pay attention to complaints that are race related because that is yeah. the purpose. It's being careful when you're talking about hiring, right. feeling, having individuals fill racial categories. That's for hiring purposes right. or appointment purposes. That's where you get into trouble. But paying attention to complaints that, uh, where there's unequal treatment on the basis of race, that's fine. That would be fine, wouldn't that's, it? That's the job of the HRC, mm -hmm. part and part. Right. So, I mean, that was... So that's the distinction, I think. So you don't write the job description? Is that what you're saying? You don't write the job description based on the first part of what you said? Well, the issue is that you couldn't, that you might get in trouble, and this is a complicated stuff, but you could get in trouble. So for example, let me give a more concrete example. Um, the racial equity panel that was debated in the legislature last year, started with having language saying that there has to be a person who filled a certain race. And that is pro almost certainly gonna be struck down by a court were it ever to be mm -hmm. litigated. Mm -hmm. So that type of selection for positions on the basis of race is problematic. But obviously paying attention to complaints on the basis of race is fine and is the job of mm -hmm. So the work doesn't determine the like the per, the personnel the personnel hours or the number of positions. Right. Hey Tom. This yes. Is Hi. Hi. Any clarification? Everyone is talking about Karen Richard latest version. I just want to confirm that is that a hard copy you guys received there tonight, or was that sent out to me this email? Can't find it. Oh, um, that would be my fault because. I didn't send it out. Oh, okay, no, no, okay, that clarifies why well, I'm having trouble. I think um, all we, what we got via email is Aton's first draft and Chief Don's right. edits, right? right? And then um, Aton just handed out Karen's edits. Karen's tonight. came okay. yesterday late. Okay. So okay, I haven't. I'm and I'm, I'm just listening. Okay, I will I will send them out her her version out, um, but I I didn't really have time because it came in at about five o'clock yesterday evening. Sure, sure. No, Sorry. No, that's okay. I'll listen. Um. Any any other details in either version? Because I think what we need to do is talk about which. Do we want to, do you want to put something together using both of them or do you want to just take one of them that you feel is better I I, I that's open I'm just asking a question Did you suggest that you're gonna throw something together from these or I, 
I was planning on just adding a couple lines that mm -hmm. could be added to either one of them, really. But so I think right. it's appropriate question if we're in go with first version or second version. Any conversation about this? Uh, I personally think I mean I like the first version, but okay. I but I almost want to defer to HRC because they're the ones who are were suggesting do this, and she picked the language for a certain reason. I don't know what that is, but um, I almost would like to. Uh, defer, but make sure that there's language in there that they work with a legislative body because you never know when it might change. You know, like they might need more resources or whatever, or work with a s systemic racism panel so there's not duplication of efforts mm -hmm. or, you know. So, uh, I, I I have no preference either way. Okay. But I but I just want to make sure that the HRC is okay with whatever that is. She, in her email to me, said, well. Via the miracle of technology and a profligate use of tungsten and other rare metals, um, she wrote, give me a moment, um, I have a slight preference for the second version, but obviously it is up to the panel. I guess that's all she wrote. Um, I thought she wrote more than that. I'm sorry, I got this late and didn't read it as closely as I had hoped. That's it. She has a slight preference for the second, but it's up to us. That's it. That was the big buildup. <laughs> We can do what we want. I'm just trying to get us to a point where we have something down that we can consider quote unquote finished and we can move on to like 6B. So that's that's all I'm trying to do here. Say so may I make a suggestion? Please, I'm hoping. I, I think that if, if, if it's Pepper, right, wants yeah. to take a stab at this, I think if he can look at one which which uh, Karen had kind of lean more to, mm -hmm. but then see what m might be missing at that that's in the second that could be added. Great. And then you can kind of have the best of both worlds. You have Great. both, right? I mean, that, and then send that out. And then okay. Go from there, I don't know. Sounds Just like a plan to me. Um, everybody on board with this? Yes. 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 I mean, we don't really need to have a vote. There's just not that many of us here. <laughs> I'm hearing yes. Okay. So, Pepper? I'll take a stab at it. Great. Yeah. Great. Um, and we'll send that out then. Great. And uh, again, feel f mark it up. Mark it up. Um, I really would like as much input on this as possible from as many of us as possible um, so that it's that we can all get behind it, at least more or less. Anything else? Wow. Well, we've gotten part of the report done, or we're making great strides towards it, I think. You're all so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I guess I, go would, ahead. I would add is that we still don't, you know, what agencies do we sort of see pumping information into this? I guess we don't know all, is it going to be all state agencies that would kind of have the ability to funnel in? And that was, that's how we look at it. Yeah. Right? And then so we really don't know how these agencies are handling these complaints right now. So we still, I think that kind of leaves that sort of out there of what is happening. Maybe we could, as we start this, we still don't know exactly. Well, how one agency is handling it and where there may be some. Mm -hmm. So if it's a clearinghouse, you know, I think that's one of Karen's concerns was, is, is it just coming in and going out and there's no touch of it, you know, it can kind of create some complications for her internally of how that sort of, I mean, I, I guess we leave that up to her. To, their at position figures that out, but we still don't know what the actual scope of what that looks like coming in. I think we should, if we can, figure out what that looks like. I don't know if that's okay. something, is that too big of a task or? 
I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I just don't, I mean, as we kind of look at this, we don't know what, I mean, we don't even have the list of agencies that would be dumping information into this. I'm wondering if that, if we're getting too much into micromanagement. I don't know. I mean, this is an advisory panel. We're writing a report for the legislature. I'm assuming that Karen or somebody will testify before them once again, and this will come up. And I don't, I think that might be in the, the details. Okay. I, I don't know. I'm throwing, I'm, I'm speaking questioningly for those of you who know better. <laughs> Yeah, it might be. I mean, I, okay. I'm just not sure, like, how big this really looks. Okay. I think our charge was just to create a, a centralized process for reporting, and that was pretty much it. So by saying, I mean, we could go as short as saying we're directing it to HRC, and our charge would be done on that. Yeah. <laughs> but we're just going more into detail because it's really up to them to figure out what they need in resources ask the legislators for those resources and we're supporting that decision. I think, I mean, I could be wrong. But. I would hope. Um, I mean, not knowing exactly how they operate, other than to Karen's description, is when we put in that they're acting as a clearing house, I would think the HRC would decide if it's a complaint that comes in that they should look at. Maintain, right. That they would exercise that, that authority. On right. the other hand, they look at it and say, this is something. Pass it on. Pass it on to the agency uh, without going into the details of mm -hmm. what the agency has. Right. She did qualify by saying guidelines developed by HRC. Right. So um, that, that would seem to take a good position in my mind. And I think personally, if nothing else, even if they're just a clearinghouse and passing it on, say, to Vermont State Police or, or HUD or somebody else, they can gather statistical data so that way people can make comprehensive decisions later on about what is coming in, if nothing else. Um, and that might even help the systemic racism panel because they're, that's, they're going to need data, right? And, and I think that even if it's just a pass-through, I think they could capture who the complainant is, what type, where to go, and, and then you at least have some analyze. You can analyze it uh, if anything else. But mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. Um, anything else on this before? We're, we're just going to let Pepper come up with what he's going to come up with, and we're going to do this again. So... <laughs> Is that all right? All right. I'm assuming. We should. I took this completely out of order. I was so excited about actually having something to work on that we missed the approval of the minutes. You have a scattered chair this evening. It's hot. So. Can we look at the minutes? Can we go backwards for a moment before we go on to the discussion of reducing racial disparity in the criminal justice system and take care of what I missed? Um, you all, I sent those out. I know I did. Um, <laughs> that I know. Uh, so any changes, addenda? I'm gathering no. Would anyone like to make a motion regarding the minutes? Motion to approve. Any? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions? Okay. Motion carries. Minutes are approved. David, will you take care of getting them up on the, the yeah, website? Yeah, we're going to have website, yeah. Okay. Um, that was easy. Now, having done that, let us go back to, or down to, the discussion of reducing racial disparity in the criminal justice system. Um, Pepper, I seem to be bothering you this evening. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I just know that like two meetings ago, you, you, were like, you were really clear that there were things you wanted to say. And well, we, I just didn't want to be missing out on that discussion. I had something that I couldn't get around last meeting. And I, 
Go yeah. for it, because well, if you've got it, go for yeah, it, because well, we've no, already started that discussion. Yeah, well, so I, I did read my section of okay. the prosecution, um, and if, David, you want to jump in at any point, feel free, because uh, we have concurrent jurisdiction over a lot mm -hmm. of issues. Um, but I think that uh, what this section really speaks to is um, prosecutors uh, have a lot of areas where they would be considered high discretion, high impact in the, in the courtroom. And, you know, a lot of public interest groups consider prosecutors to be the most powerful uh, player in the courtroom. Um, you know, we don't necessarily agree with that position, uh, right. but uh, there certainly are a lot of decisions where we kind of set the tone. Um, and that includes bail decisions, uh, using diversion, alternative justice, um, of course, charging decisions and uh, sentencing decisions. We kind of make recommendations in all of those. Um, plea, plea bargains, of right. course. Uh, you know, the, this section of the report kind of lays out the various areas where prosecutors have a lot of uh, discretion. Mm -hmm. And what, what the report says is it's really important um, that these, the kind of decision making be transparent, that, uh, that we, you know, they don't necessarily say that you need to have strict guidelines because each case is uh, very fact specific, but um, at least that your decision making process is transparent and that um, people can see why a prosecutor maybe made a plea decision in this set of circumstances and not in that, even though they may on their face look to be similar. Um, uh, it, it suggests that uh, there's kind of this nas National District Attorneys Association standards um, that kind of lay out the various roles of the prosecutor and, and when and how to use uh, discretion wisely. That's a good, it's a good document that I've looked at. Um, there's a link to it in footnote mm -hmm. 56. Um, we've shared it with all of our prosecutors in the past. Um, it's, you know, it's tough. I will say that it is somewhat tough that prosecutors are individually elected. Um, the state's attorneys are elected. Um, so a lot of, you know, our department is there and we control their budgets, but we can't necessarily tell them how to act. Um, we do have trainings every single year, um, year annual trainings, where I, and I deliver the kind of legislative update to all of them, and I kind of explain to them that, you know, if, we, if there isn't some consistency or at least transparency in the way that you guys are making decisions, that um, there, there will be legislative initiatives to take away prosecutors' discretion for things like diversion referrals mm -hmm. um, or sentencing. You know, there's a um, sentencing commission that we also serve on um, that's looking at kind of reducing sentence ranges, um, reducing uh, mandatory minimums, for instance, for certain crimes. And those are not those are areas where the prosecutor has some discretion, but you know it's going to be reduced if there isn't more consistency. In the county. And so that's a message that I like to drive home as much as possible at these annual trainings. Um, trying to think. Um, Can know, I ask a question? Sure. Have you any sense of how successful those trainings have been in? Well, it, it's interesting because one thing that this says is to really kind of collect data on, on these things. Mm -hmm. And the Attorney General's office actually does collect data on our di diversion referrals. And there was a somewhat recent change um, in the law that says that um, a lot of kind of lower level offenses will be presumptively referred to diversion unless the prosecutor states on the record why they wouldn't be referred to diversion. Um, and there's a number of reasons why a low level offense wouldn't be referred to diversion. Um, well, you know, that's again part of this transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll have to stay on record why. Um, and the Attorney General's office um, keeps track of that, those numbers. And I think that's very helpful. And it's, it, it helps prosecutors, that, you know, know, knowing that they're being kind of looked at and, and that they need to kind of justify this. And, and we've actually added a section to our case management software that allows. Prosecutors can't move forward mm -hmm. um, with the case until they've kind of lit, uh, chosen from a drop-down list of options why someone wouldn't be referred to diversion when there's no, a non-referral. So we can now easily track and pull a report from our case management software of all the non-referrals to diversion and then one step further, the reason why they weren't. Mm -hmm. So that's um, so that that kind of you know that kind of 
observation principle works in changing behavior, I think. Right. Um, and it's, it has been helpful to have that. Good. And this presumption has been working. We've seen double digit increases in diversion referrals over the last two years because of this presumption. Is that up to date too as what the cases are? Is there any backlog or delay in that so as far as the software? So the, that case management, we had to train on it first. We only really only have one annual training, you know, where everyone's in the room together. So we couldn't really uh, put it as a mandatory field. It was there and people were using it, but it's now mandatory now. You can't move forward without it. Um, and that's that kicked in in June. So we don't have a fully full you know, year. We have a couple months of it, solid data. Now. I guess my other point is how much, what other data points are you collecting on that? That, that right, I, as far as I know, that's the only um, one related to kind of the discretionary points. Um, yeah, I can say the AG's office does collect um, data for the diversion referrals um, through our programs that run diversion. Um, it's not as it's it, and this is actually one of the things that I was going to talk about on, on this piece um, it doesn't collect all the data that might be helpful for us in understanding racial disparities issues it is sort of a basic just basic but just starting right now this is just numbers. a new program that's been implemented no it's not a new program the version's been around for a long time right. obviously but the software um, right. the software is the newest yeah, right. change this this change in terms of the presumption has been around for what is it now not yet or like yeah, 16 months yeah. anyway it's been around for a little over eight, somewhere between a year and two years so that was a big change uh, and our data that we collect which again is raw number type of data does show a very large increase statewide the differences between counties remain um, but every county has increased and um, the overall increase has been like a doubling of diversion referrals uh, there was one new diversion program that got added called the Tamarack program we're calling it the Tamarack program and it's intended for people who may have longer criminal records but who are clearly behaving the way they are because of substance abuse and mental health issues other interventions haven't worked so it's sort of giving prosecutors a new tool of saying if other things aren't working give this a try doesn't matter what their prior record was uh, you can try to put them into this program that really focuses on treatment so that is a new thing that got instituted at the same time the presumption was instituted, and that's partly why the numbers have gone up so much. I would say you, another. Yeah. Well, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to shift topics. So go ahead. Now, mine's no. more broad. Um, so another high impact, high discretion area that the report focuses on mostly, or at least the prosecution section, is on bail determinations. Mm -hmm. um, again, this is an area where I think prosecutors have been doing pretty well. Um, you know, we had a big uh, bail reform package that passed last year um, that um, really focused on making sure that uh, especially low-level offenders were not being held uh, merely for their inability to afford bail. Um, and I think that that is going to have a substantial impact that we'll see play through. Um, but, you know, one thing that I, the only reason I say I think the prosecutors have been doing pretty well is because we did see a DOC report, and I'm sure there's ways to kind of look at data um, in different ways, but the DOC report did show that for kind of misdemeanors um, that there were not a huge number of people being held um, for lack of, for their inability right. to pay. I, you know, it, there was a, there's a number of detainees, I think around 400, it's been 400 right around that area for decades. Um, and 400? 400, 400 pretrial detainees. Okay. Um, and, you know, it, it, there weren't a lot, it, there were, the data didn't indicate, it was just a snapshot from a single day. But it, it showed that there was probably maybe about 25 people um, that were in strictly because of their inability to pay to afford bail. But they, but it really was deeper than that. You know, right. it was hard to show that maybe you know they might have been people that were trying to get time served, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, you know the data showed some positive signs about the bail system in, mm -hmm. in Vermont. And with these new kind of bail, the new bail package, we're going to see, I think, an even even better outcomes. Okay. Just to follow up the discussion on bail, um, 
that number that uh, Pepper mentioned, the 400, it has been about the same for it's been 10, flat, yeah, 12 years. Goes up and down a little bit, but mm -hmm. not much. Um, and that's usually about uh, 30, 35 uh, female, and the rest are male population. Um, about a year ago, um, the after hours bail decisions uh, had been, I don't want to say all had been made by court clerks, but a lot of them had been. Wow. And we've switched that out um, as a result of another committee that most of us are on <laughs> involving pretrial services. And so the judges are now the only ones that are authorized to set monetary bail okay. after hours. Um, so that's been about a year. Uh, mm -hmm. It hasn't changed the, the numbers uh, a lot. Interesting. But the snapshot that Pepper's talking about was done um, sometime in the spring. We just did another one, or DOC provided another one. Uh, recently, and there was one we looked at this issue about four or five years ago, six years ago. Numbers are surprisingly the same, but the snapshot that uh, Pepper was talking about of the 400, roughly half of them were held without bail. Okay. Um, and that has remained again fairly constant in terms of percentage. And the next group, the large group, were serious uh, felonies, uh, usually involving violence. Get down to about 20 somewhere around 20 to 25 misdemeanors. Uh, mm. About half of those were domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. So people didn't ordinarily question a judgment on those types of cases. So it really only left about 12 to 15 cases mm -hmm. that were misdemeanors. Um, and even then, you would have to go into each one of those cases to understand better why bail was set. And there could be a number of reasons. It might be a misdemeanor offense, $200 bail. Um, it may be that there's an underlying probation mm -hmm. um, violation right. that they're being held without bail on, and they're just setting bail on a shoplifting charge, right. somebody's out on probation, so they're getting credit on that. Um, and there are other uh, circumstances that um, just the number alone doesn't tell you the whole right. story. Right. So for whatever reason, that number has remained pretty constant over the years, and um, it's one we just can't seem to mm -hmm. change, but the, right. the numbers were pretty consistent with about six years ago. Same thing, about 20 to 25 mm -hmm. cases that we looked at, and so they, for the most part, they are misdemeanors. Okay. Um, what happens if they can't make bail? I mean, they just they stay there. They stay there. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. So I would just say two other areas. I think I also serve on other committees that are dealing with. Um, we, you know, DOC is working on a um, racial disparities in sentencing practices, and they have a report that's about to come out, which I've seen in early copies of. And they say there's not really too much of a variation amongst in, amongst sentencing practices based on race. So that's okay. a good sign. Um, that report, I think, is coming out November 1st, and they'll be in front of the Joint Justice Oversight Committee um, to talk about that. Um, and I'm sure Lisa, um, Commissioner Bernard, will be happy to yeah. present it to this I would bet. panel, too. I will. Um, and then another uh, committee. Thank you. <laughs> another committee that I'm on is um, around expungement, and that's another area where um, uh, prosecutors have a, a fair amount of discretion. Um, in granting expungements or stipulating to expungements. And again, you know, our state's attorneys are actively seeking to expand expungement opportunities. They're holding expungement clinics around the state. And I think that um, it's an area where, you know, when you're talking about kind of getting people that have kind of demonstrated that their life is back on track and the only thing holding them back from getting a good job or housing or something is a criminal charge that's, you know, five to seven years old or older. Um, I think that that is something that state attorneys are more than happy to um, kind of take off people's records. Okay. What's the cost associated with that? Expungements? Yeah. The, are you talking is about the, societal costs? Or are you talking about like actual for the dollars person, and cents? Yeah, dollars and cents are a person who kind of, does um, it depend? What, I think it's there a lot of, 190. There's a $90, 90. filing fee hmm. to request expungement. But there is a way that the courts to waive that fee. Um, there's a kind of informal papyrus form that okay. people can fill out, um, and then have the courts will usually just waive it. Yeah, if they qualify, they go on. Okay. All right. Reduced or, or fee waiver, they have to file a form, essentially financial. Yeah, they the same type of affidavit. We use a lot of other things okay. for waiver. 
Right. So it's not geared specifically to exploit. I'm channeling Sheila here. Would it is it is that something that's easily found? The information for that is made very much available about the expungement and the form. And I mean that's something she's awfully concerned, as we all know, with accessibility and things being easily found in the process. And I'm just wondering if that's something I'm that say, I'm going to say no. Okay. For the following reason. When I first went on the bench, expungements were extremely rare. Okay. If if anything. So there's been a, a, a real evolution, mm -hmm. revolution in, in expanding expungement. So I think a lot of people with the old records weren't aware of it, and they've long since forgotten about even the possibility of it. It uh -huh. did not exist. Right. So this whole idea of now expunging and going back is something that is relatively new. new. Yeah. Um, and particularly in the last year, two, three different uh, counties have had essentially what they call expungement days when the state's attorneys make themselves available uh, to meet with folks to see if they qualify uh, okay. initially. So there's, there's been a lot of um, movement, a lot of movement around that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. On that, in that respect, I think the most that we can do is try and publicize these expungement days as widely as possible. Our state's attorneys are getting right. on the radio. I know that uh, T.J. Donovan, when he was the state's attorney, did a driver restoration day. Mm -hmm. you know, he and the governor were kind of yelling from the rooftops about it to get people interested in this. And it's one of those things where it's really kind of on the person to know that expungement is, exists and when they're eligible and, and uh, those kind of things. We are part of our charge in this other committee that I'm working on is to look at creating an automatic expungement, which um, is difficult. And, what we're trying to do is, is create what would be considered a petitionless expungement, okay. whereas the, our case management software, if all of the criteria are met, you know, the five years has elapsed and it's a qualifying crime and there hasn't been, there haven't been any new convictions, you know, all the all the rest of the criteria that have been met, then our case management software would automatically generate a petition that our state's attorneys could then review the case and um, sign off on it or stipulate to it. Um, so automatic is kind of the, not the correct term, mm -hmm. but that's what the charge asked us to look at. And so we're trying to develop something like that. We don't have the technology just yet. And, you know, there's a lot of issues around expungement and making sure that court fees are paid and that restitution has been paid um, to the victims, um, that we would need to be able to speak to various systems in order to mm -hmm. have this work. But that could be a potential way where people don't have to know about it and they could just um, kind of have some sort of petitionless uh, right. form of expungement. Okay. Okay. Is that it for? I think that's it for my section. I mean, okay. I'm happy to have uh, a broader conversation about the role of the prosecutor and the, in, in this, but. Um, you know, the, the this section of the article really focused on bail and right. um, yeah. uh, issues around the ones I've covered. Okay. David, is there anything you want to? Um, James has covered a lot of the detail, a lot of the areas in detail. I think a couple things that I would add. One, um, TJ isn't afraid to say that the prosecutor is the most powerful person. <laughs> in the world. agree with that assessment. He does say it a lot. Um, and I think, so that, so that individual discretion piece is really important, you know, the high impact, high discretion part of a prosecutor's job is important to keep in mind. The other thing that I think we always try to think about is if all you think about is the prosecutor's decision making power, you can find yourself walking into a corner where you're saying, well, the only way we can change the system is by changing people's mind and behavior. And that's obviously a very important thing to do. Right. But there are also systematic things that we can do mm -hmm. to change things. And, and Pepper brought a lot of them up. Expungements is one thing. Bail is another thing. These are things we have been working on. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, sort of cabining that discretion a little bit, making it a little less wide than it is now, while still leaving people with the tools to deal with folks who are genuinely dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is something that we always think about and struggle with and the best ways to do that. Obviously, discretion is necessary to the system, um, uh, but promoting fairness is both 
changing minds and also mm -hmm. changing systems as best right. we can. So that's just sort of a very broad conceptual thing in terms of how we think about these things. But we've been working together on a lot of these specific ideas around expungements. Obviously, Bale was a big piece last year. Mm -hmm. um, the piece that I'll add is on the Attorney General's Office program specifically, which are pretrial alternative justice programs, um, both diversion, uh, which we were talking about, Tamarack, which is a new version of diversion, that's a confusing phrase. <laughs> and um, <Yeah. laughs> pretrial services, which is a relatively new, not as new as Tamarack. It's been around maybe three, four years now, but uh, our office took it over, um, I think, officially in late 2016. And we've been really working to make that more robust. There have been issues around actually having that be a workable program. Um, and that is one where folks are still on the normal path to being adjudicated, but they have an opportunity to engage in services. Mm -hmm. And successful engagement, the argument goes, could potentially lead to better outcomes uh, if you can show judges and prosecutors that there has been engagement uh, where substance abuse, mental health may have been part of the issue. One thing that we haven't been doing we, we have a lot of data on it, we have a lot of numbers on it. Uh, one thing we haven't been doing is having any, da any data that would tell us whether or not <coughs> decisions are being made uh, in racially disparate ways. And right. The most specific example is our staff decides when somebody successfully completed diversion or not. Mm -hmm. it, it would be a fair question to ask if those, uh, if across yeah. the whole system, um, people of color, maybe, I don't know if this is happening, but it could be the case that people of color are being deemed to complete diversion successfully at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. um, that would be in accordance with other numbers we see. Right. But um, I don't know that to be true, and we don't have the data one way or the other to say if that's true. So I think that's something that we have to think about, and we will think about, in terms of mm -hmm. um, being able to check ourselves and, mm -hmm. and how our programs are operating. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. Is I know that a lot of things when it comes to judge discretion, prosecutor discretion, sentencing discretion, and all of these are all based on uh, opinion or perception or how somebody feels. In other words, that's kind of a non-bias. Uh, I, I just, is there anything that, maybe there's not, maybe everything is like, depending upon the situation and depending upon the victim, what they have to say, and uh, is there any measurement to be able to take some of that opinion out of the mix? I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not part of the whole justice system, but it's, it seems like one of the things that we always come back to is, uh, you know, implicit bias or something, because, you know, people, it, it's, they're, they're not thinking that they're doing anything that's biased, mm -hmm. but it's just kind of ingrained. Mm -hmm. And all of these things, regardless of people thinking they may be doing okay, is there an inherent bias that they wouldn't be aware of? That's because it's all opinion based. It's all how do I feel about or or yeah, they they feel I feel like they've completed it or given a good effort or I mean, how do you remove some of that? Out, I, I don't know. It's just a question. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know if you can, because it's human nature, right? I mean, a lot of stuff. But I'm just, is there any non well, some of those, some of, so an example of one way that you might try to counter, um, for example, sentencing being entirely up to, you know, the judge based on his or her perception of the case might be, as in the federal system, to develop what are referred to as sentencing guidelines, where for a certain conviction for a certain offense, um, various factors are sort of like numerically considered and calculated and you end up with a result in a certain range, right? But, and the federal system did that many years ago and the problem with that is that, for example, um, crack cocaine convictions guidelines are much higher than co you know regular cocaine conviction guidelines and that often breaks down on uh, ra ra along, along race lines so 
I totally hear what you're saying, at, but like sometimes the response is to how do we make it more consistent for everybody where like their implicit bias can't come in and uh, like are, are, are just as problematic almost. It's really challenging. I mean, so some of the, some of the comments in this report about what, what the criminal defense bar can do. I mean, so reading this was interesting because like we, we, and I mean our system in general, not just the criminal defense bar, already do some good things, right? Mm -hmm. So we, um, you know, everyone who is requesting court-appointed counsel in our system has a public defender from the first appearance in court. So, um, so that, you know, so, so someone advocating for bail or, you know, identifying, um, you know, advocating and trying to make sure that everyone, regardless of um, race or where they're from or you know whatever, is ha is has advocacy uh, at that first stage. Um, I think uh, the Defender General and the Criminal Defense Bar in general. I mean, we do a lot of training. You know, we have CLE requirements, um, and I certainly know that there have been some um, panels in recent years on implicit bias, for example. I think we probably could be more intentional about really um, regularly doing trainings to identify and address racial disparities and how we can, you know, sort of more systemically as a defense bar kind of try to challenge things. It's really hard because mm -hmm. everything is on such a case-by-case -case basis. It, People I find are hesitant, you know, whenever I try, so when I, for example, try to say, you know, here are sentences that other people have gotten for this offense in the past, um, you know, that are consistent with what I'm asking for for my client. I, I tend to find that um, prosecutors and judges <laughs> are resistant to try to make those comparisons because every case is different, right? Yeah, I suppose every case is different, but it sure seems like all the black guys who get charged right. with selling drugs are getting more harsh sentences than like the white women mm -hmm. uh, who are getting charged with, you know, who are getting convicted of selling drugs. So it's very challenging, and I don't. It, what's hard is to to think about how there might be a systemic way to mm -hmm. address this versus every individual criminal defense attorney having to, you know, I mean, we all do file motions when we think that a car stop was based, illegally based on race or, you know, um, but that's very individual and it's harder to think about in a big picture way. I don't know, Rebecca, if you're there, do you have anything to add <laughs> about the report? Rebecca? Let's see if this is even on. I had it on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, I do have a lot of, of, of things to respond to and to contribute to the discussion. I, I, maybe what Aitana could ask is, is the next agenda to, to get sort of the DG defense bar response to some of the things I heard from Judge Pearson and sure. I think it was Sid and Pepper on, on – on sort of the numbers that we see and, and the bail numbers being consistent and relatively low, and I think I heard that there didn't seem to be very much variance based on race and the ultimate sentences imposed, but I might have misheard that. But I would love to have an opportunity to sort of share a different perspective of how race plays, because I think, I think one of the things that I heard the chief ask, which is, in response to the statements that there are a lot of variables at play whenever there's a charging decision to be made or a bail decision made by a judge and the required factors that don't have race-based uh, reasoning, but that implicitly involve racial bias, mm -hmm. such as is there a risk of flight issue and a bail request and a bail decision? Is that based on someone who lives out of state, how you know oh. where they came from, or what whether that's impacted by the person coming from an urban environment versus someone from a rural, mm -hmm. and how that then translates to the color of the defendant's skin, right? 
implicitly. Instead of me sort of sharing thoughts, could I ask a question about, I think it was Pepper, um, when you were identifying the prosecution through various points, critical stages, um, you mentioned about the need for transparency in the charging decision and how there's been some training on that. Uh, that need, and I, I was hoping to hear a little more detail on, on ideas on how that could become more transparent to the public. Um, I I don't know how it could be. I was uh, saying that that's what's important. That's an area that uh, the report identified as uh, increasing public trust is having transparency. Um, we haven't trained on that per se, but uh, I, I'm open to ideas on that. Um, I mean, having strict guidelines, I think, doesn't make sense because, you know, again, these are going to be uh, very fact-based situations, but... Um, uh, you know, being open and on the record, I think, uh, as to why a charging decision was made, or I, I don't know. It's it's something that I'd be very open to discussing. And and I, I just want to say, I, I'm trying to dig a little deeper, right? Because one of the things I noticed in this report was, say, for instance, say it starts out where maybe somebody's profiled and gets stopped, mm -hmm. right? And then they don't have a lot of money, so they get assigned a public defender. Well, that public defender may have a super amount of caseload, so he's trying to pump through as much as he can. So that may be more of a reason to take a plea deal because the guy can't pay. So all of a sudden now when it gets to another item, now he shows that he's got multiple convictions, so now he's going to get a harsher sentence or no bail because he had to plea in order to get back and, you know, just take a deal and go. So, I, I, so part of, I think... What I was reading from this report is at each stage, how do you kind of look at that and try to um, root that out? Because, like I said, to technically, you know, if a poorer person can't afford to be in to fight a, a certain uh, charge, and he's got a public defender, and he the the guy says, well, just take a take a plea, and you're out of here tomorrow. You get back to work, feed your family, just keep your nose clean, and then all of a sudden something else happens. Mm -hmm. And now he's got two convictions, right? Mm -hmm. And now the other guy might be still appealing or fighting the other. So I, I, that's where that's where I'm thinking, because from a judge, he just sees there's three there's three prior. Uh, plea deals, and now this guy and now got, others, yeah. got a, He's he's now uh, habitual, right? Right. So we're not gonna we're we're gonna up it or create more bail because we know that he might be a repeat offender. But in reality, uh, you know, that's because he had to take a plea because he couldn't afford to to defend. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. Like, how do we? I mean, maybe that's not our issue, but how do you how do you get to that um, that building? Because this report was saying one builds on the other, right. builds on the other, which now builds on the other. So that's the thing that we have to look for in order to break that down. That's why when, when Pepper says, well, sometimes we don't look at the prior ones, we just base it on this case and has there been an issue, because that's kind of cool, right? I mean, because on a, on a nonviolent charge, it might be okay, like, okay, we're taking it at a merit as, at a, as its own case. Right, I mean, it's only based on its own merits, not the totality of, okay, how many convictions? Or you look at what those other pleas were, mm -hmm. and how does that play in? I, I, I don't know. Maybe you do that now, but I would say we always look at the criminal history uh, to the extent it exists. I mean, again, the expungements are there to kind of remove yep. when someone is shown, right? When the when these criminal charges no longer have any value, uh, yep. predictive value, then they we try and get them off. And, but uh, I would say we always look at a criminal history when we're making charging decisions. Because to me, it'd be kind of cool to say, okay, this guy's got three convictions, but he, he put in waivers for all three of them because he couldn't afford it, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, does that have something to do with it or maybe not? Maybe that's too much work. But anyway, I'm just wondering. It's not too much work, work, but you'll never get it. You'll never you know. know. You'll right. never know whether the person pled because they were being detained and you know, right. the economic circumstances are they wanted to get out, so they took a plea. And that's why these individual sentences, without knowing all of the facts behind them, it's hard. It's hard to compare uh, one sentence to another without knowing what all the circumstances are. I mean that. Yeah. And you don't have time to research all that either. I mean, I don't think. Well, in terms of research, I mean, depending on the nature of the case, 
90, 95% of all criminal cases filed are resolved in a plea agreement. Okay. Uh, the court has the authority to reject the plea agreement or you know, alter it to some extent. Uh, and, and that happens, uh, but I wouldn't say a, a great deal. In part because by the time the case gets to the, the court on a plea agreement, by that time, all I have in front of you is, is the, the original affidavit of what the circumstances were that brought the incident to the attention of the police and resulted in a certain charge. By the time it gets to me with a plea agreement, uh, the, the prosecutor and the defense attorney know that case factually probably better than I ever will. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a matter of, of rejecting a plea agreement because you don't like it. You, you should be asking the state and the defense, why do you want me to accept this agreement? And hopefully I will get the information uh, from both sides mm -hmm. as to why, um, if, if it's truly a plea agreement they've achieved, they're both recommending it to me. So although I have the authority, you want to be careful in exercising that authority that you don't base your decision on what you I'm see in an right. affidavit that may be a year old by now. And, mm -hmm. You know, it may be situations, it's certainly not uncommon for a, a victim to, in talking with the, the uh, prosecutor, they don't want to go through the process. Right. Um, so the, there are any number of ways the cases come to us by way of plea agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, there are others where it's a contested sentencing, and usually those are in the, in the more serious cases, uh, where a pre-sentence investigation by the Department of Corrections um, is requested mm -hmm. and, uh, they can either make a recommendation or not that varies from judge to judge so there's a significant amount of discretion mm -hmm. that the court has but as I said 90 to 95 percent of these cases are, are resolved on plea agreements some of which may be exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. that the the prior record which is a fact that we look at we don't know why the person pled guilty to three other similar charges. Uh, they may have been economic circumstances, may have been uh, lack of witness. It, it could be any number of mm -hmm. issues. I'm not familiar with the study that you said is coming out. I, I knew they were the, the um, I think it's Karen Burnett's group. Is, mm -hmm. uh, no? No, this is DOC data. You're on, talking about... On the sentencing? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who's doing the study. I'm not yeah. familiar with it. There mm -hmm. was one study back in 2014, 2015 mm -hmm. uh, sentencing study that um, did not indicate that they couldn't find evidence of racial bias. Was there also a okay. Yale study a few years ago as well? Rebecca, do you know? Uh, this topic just came up at a meeting I was at earlier today um, about trying to collect data about racial disparities in setting bail, and someone said that she thought that there had been a study done where I, the Defender General's Office and DOC actually provided data a few years ago, and maybe um, like Vermont Criminal Research Group maybe issued a report? I don't know. Hmm. Does that sound? I, I'm not familiar. If there is such a report, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. On bail, uh, CRG or the old group, whatever their name was, did the sentencing study that I was referring to, right. but I'm not familiar with the bail study. Rebecca, no. is, does that ring any bells for you? It doesn't, but I'll run it down and, and check. I, I, can I just inject uh, an example of how we the, the racism, the implicit bias in our system is hidden? Let's just take for these for purposes of this point that the sentencing numbers doesn't necessarily show that for X offender, white, black, uh, who has five, um, well, let's, we're, we're at, I guess where, I, let me back up. Um, so any number, Judge Pearson made a point that there are any number of reasons, including 100% innocent, that someone will plead guilty to a charge of that, right? That they just didn't do it. We also know that the, that the increased contact that a person has with law enforcement, you know, and, and getting exposed to the criminal justice system eventually leads to conviction, right? We know that the presence of law enforcement and the greater exposure to law enforcement doesn't happen 
across all demographics equally, you know, economic and race, right? We, and, and so the question that I have back to Pepper and the and David Shirt, I don't know if there are other prosecutors in the room, um, back to sort of accepting, I don't think any of us question that there is implicit racism in each of us, but we each have implicit bias. And at the beginning of this panel student, there was a lot of emphasis on the studies out there from Harvard, encouragement that we all take these, these tests, right? And just by our exposure and living um, that we have these personal experiences, accepting that, right? And then accepting that as a prosecutor, there is this incredible amount of discretion I find it really a great opportunity to sort of, I appreciate David Shore's point, which is that so much of this is political and personal, and how much can we really try to change personal choices? Except that, back to why I was questioning Temple more on the transparency, and I appreciate if you don't have you know, something to explore to dig deeper, what are other prosecutors' offices doing to establish the transparency? But I think, as Jessica was pointing out, as defense attorneys, we see it in a case by case situation where we just see the same individuals and why is this defendant who's a person of color getting charged here for this higher um, amount when this other person left the bar was on the scene? Why, why, why were no charges brought there? Now, that's where our numbers, when you take it all the way to sentencing, won't necessarily show that. It starts from the initial decision to arrest, continues on to the initial decision to prosecute. Uh, and then the initial request for sentencing, and then ultimately what the judge decides to do. Um, but back to Pepper and this opportunity that we have, that the legislature has granted us, how to get trained up so that we identify it within ourselves and our specific professional goals, so that we can be checked, and we can be sensitive, and how to do that regularly, not just once every five years, check the box, but we can be training. Okay. Um, Rebecca, were you done there? Was that a period? I'm sorry, I went on for too long. No, 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 no. Not, that's not what I meant. I just, it's hard to know when you're not here. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, just to shift this slightly, but not really, um, this is really, to my mind, extremely fruitful, but I'd like us all to bear in mind um, that we have to translate this into some kind of series, I'm assuming, of recommendations that go into the report that we're producing. Um, six... We just we were talking about six A, but before that, it's um, that's something that's included and made very specific as six A, which we were just talking about. But the report is about recommendations to address systemic implicit bias in Vermont's criminal and juvenile justice system. So it seems to me that we need to bear in mind. I mean, as I say, this is very fruitful, but we've also got to figure out how we're going to translate this actually into a report, into text. Um, and I, I want to keep that in mind here as we have this discussion. I'm not trying to curtail its fruitfulness, but I'm just trying to direct it in a certain sense that maybe what we need to do, I know that the idea of subcommittees is not particularly popular, but I also know that there are people with different expertise sitting around the table and it might be useful for those people to clump together and actually produce some, some actual recommendations that they can bring to the whole body and we can discuss. And I just want to put that out there before we go any further, that um, I think that that's something to bear in mind here, um, that we really have to make very specific recommendations to the General Assembly. They didn't function particularly well, from what I'm gathering, the last time that was tried. Um, but I'm, I'm just floating it again. Why subcommittees didn't? Well, 
Hey, Tom, are you thinking about uh, going through the other sections of six? Yes, I am. But I also went back a little further to just six, not A, B, or C, gotcha. to say A, B, and C are including. So we've done one of the includings, but this, this whole conversation seems to me to be part of a broader um, fund of recommendations that might well be put into the report. And I'm just trying to figure out how we translate this conversation into specific recommendations. I mean, a couple meetings ago, Lieutenant Scott was floating the idea that we needed more data from different agencies in order to do that. That, I, I don't know, where'd that go? I, I don't even remember what happened to that. But I, I just, I don't want to stop this, but I also want to focus us a little bit on, we've got to figure out how to take this really great conversation and make it concrete. One thing to look at is the, potentially, I don't know if this will be helpful or not, but looking at the earlier um, sections of our charge, there's mm -hmm. one through six. So yeah. We've only been really focusing on six. But, yes, um, we decided to start there. Right, but in terms of your, I think, entirely correct comments that we're talking about big issues here, it may be the, that, you know, and we want to include them, uh, it may be the case that we can find pieces of those other uh, sections that fit neatly into some of our conversations and then decide that, we, sure, we'll do a report on six, but, you know, our report can always include something from mm -hmm. other sections and we could choose where we want to focus energy. Um, and, I, and I'm getting... Um, <laughs> help here on, on Great. Out which sections may be most helpful because I haven't reviewed them very recently. But okay. That's a general idea for directing us without completely trying to address everything. Right, right, because we're not gonna. <laughs> I mean, that's just... And I think personally, too, that um, we know always education is always something that everybody's going to recommend no matter what you're doing. So that is almost a given that, like you said, once instead of once every five years or once every one year that there's more cultural competency training or mm -hmm. something along those lines right but i i also don't know that at a low cost or uh, only somebody's time that like maybe maybe the attorney general's office sends something like a survey monkey out to their people and say what would you do or what do you see or or how would you improve just a bullet point four or five mm -hmm. questions so people are you know, maybe the maybe the court system does the same. Maybe the Department of Corrections. Hey, what have you seen? What? How would you improve this situation? Come up with a list of those questions and then get that feedback. And maybe because it's hard when you got three people making a decision for an entire department. Right. Right. I mean, even though they're the heads, but it might be nice to see what's coming from the front lines or what's coming from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I mean, if you were doing a mailer, yeah, that'd be expensive. But a survey monkey. If you already have the email addresses of the state departments, mm -hmm. you might be able to do a, hey, we'd like to your complete this survey, and you might get 20% return, but at least it's better than 0% return. Right. Um, I don't know, suggestion? Mm -hmm. And might give some insights? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know what people think about that, but I mean, you need Comment? to formulate the questions. That's your question. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I appreciate um, and Rebecca's suggestion that um, you can't just have a training and right. think that we're done, that actually building in, um, you know, institutionalized opportunities to um, assess our own behavior, to assess our own decision making, I think that has to be part of that and I think that has to be coupled with training. And um, I have seen really strong inventories um, that are more focused on an organization and how you can look at where you are in terms of um, uh, a, a number of things. And I'm imagining that um, there has to be something like that that would apply to the criminal mm -hmm. justice system and the juvenile justice system out there. I'm just curious whether anybody's come across something like that. Can Anybody? Can you say more about so, um, you mean the inventory? Yeah. Um, like a cultural in inventory, like those assessment tools? It's, uh, well, what I actually was working on when I worked for the city of Burlington was a, um, it was an inventory that looked at like 12 measures. 
So it was it ranged from what is your training for staff, how do you deal with clients, um, all the way up to um, your hiring practices and things like that. And so then you could look and see where you are and then where you wanted to move to. And I just thought um, that actually helped us to put in some practices that I think our, um, the organization I ran within the um, city felt pretty good about, you know, that we were moving towards being um, more inclusive in our work. So I'm just wondering, I mean, that's obviously different than what, you know, we're looking to do here. But my feeling is that you have to be able to institutionalize something that you just can't ignore. Mm -hmm. You have to keep doing, you know, what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, obviously, we're going to keep going with this. I mean, I, it's, it just seems very fruitful. Am I wrong? I mean, I'm just feeling like this is bringing up a lot of stuff that could, in fact, result in recommendations and that we should continue the process here. Um, well, if, if the ultimate decision in any criminal proceeding is sentencing, right. um, if, if you said there's a new sentencing study coming out, Within the next few weeks, that'd be great. Maybe we could start with that, with that, and whatever that discloses, and maybe that will give us uh, something to work on. That from would. There. When is that? What's the date that that's coming out? That study. I'll, the I'll double check. Okay, yeah. that was. Right. I'm sorry. I'm looking at you when I'm no, saying it. But. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I, sorry. November first, you said. I th it's either November first or December first. One of the first. It's been, yeah, it's been. <laughs> it's a first. There's an early draft that I've seen, but it's not ready for public consumption just yet. Got it. I think the data is out. The yeah. report is not. Okay. If that's what you're talking right. about. Yeah. Probably not even a draft of the report yet. Maybe just. The I've data. just seen the data. We Okay, just the data. Yeah, you can have that. Lisa's already said she'll send that to you, and you can... Oh, she will. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to that. All right. Anything else? I'm just moving us along because I'm mindful of the time. No? Pardon? All right. Um, this will come up again. <laughs> It'll be on the agenda next time to continue this. Um, let's move on to public commentary. Anne Schroeder is here, and she has a very, she assures me, organized one page, and one page I, I bullet pointed. Out as we go. Right. <laughs> so, and um, I'm um, with the People Power, Wyndham County People Power ACLU. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a real novice at all of this, but um, I'm, I'm a concerned citizen, so I'm all here. Um, and I, one of the things that I was going to talk about was the bail, and which we were talking about already. And because um, I had seen also the 400 people, and but that, that was out of 1,700. So that seems pretty high to me. Is that correct? The 1,700 are the sentenced. Those are the sentenced ones. 400 okay, so are detainees. It's, it's, those are two separate numbers then. They are. Okay. That, yeah, whatever. Uh, well, no. Not quite out of the 17. Uh, I think no, they're it, very few. Very few. That's that. That was reassuring to me because I had I had read about this and was concerned because this would affect people of poverty. No question. Um, I mean, it's just how it goes. Um, and I was also interested. I mean, I, I read about the H seven two eight bill that was passed, and that will improve things. Um, that's good. Um, but I, places like New Jersey have gotten rid of bail completely in most cases. So, and so far, the way it's working out, um, it looks pretty good. So, I mean, and, and it's not for people with serious, serious criminal um, things. In fact, I think they've made it harder for people with, with serious crimes. Um, but I also realize that getting H728 through, um, because some of the, some of the uh, Vermont senators wanted a higher limit, that it may not be a time to push for anything else. Uh, because they wanted, like, I think, a thousand, and it ended up at two hundred or something like that. So, anyhow, uh, that was something I was concerned about. I think that really affects people of color and, and because of the poverty issue. Um, another thing that I'm interested in was the um, 
you know, I know you've been doing 6A, but going back to two and three of the charges, mm -hmm. um, I, I've been researching uh, since last year the fair and impartial policing policy. Um, that's been one of the things that our group has been doing. And I ran across this uh, Cleveland consent decree. Um, someone in the, AC, the general ACLU uh, turned me on to this idea of the consent, consent decrees. And these are, these are judicial decisions, as far as I can understand, against departments that have done some pretty bad things. And it's, uh, it, I was very impressed with this. It's a 110-page report. Um, and it, it addresses things like the model trainings. Um, that's in number two of the chart, de-escalation. Um, and training ideas such as self-evaluation strategies to identify racial or ethnic profiling. Um, and problem-oriented problem policing, procedural justice, um, avoiding contact that may lead to bias policing. It just there was an awful lot in this report, and so if any, I just thought I'd throw that out. Okay. There. I happened to run into it, um, and um, I, I, I had never even heard of these consent decrees. <laughs> uh, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about was a little more about implicit bias, um, and. This is something that I, I'm from Wyndham County, and um, in the fair and impartial policing policy um, that the state passed December 12th, um, 2017, it, it says employees are prohibited from engaging in biased policing, which, good. Um, but the Wyndham County Sheriff has added into his policy um, the word intentionally. So it says employees are prohibited from intentionally engaging in biased policing. Um, so and to me, this seems like, well, then the, the law enforcement person would just say, oh, well, I didn't mean to. You know, it kind of removes this whole implicit bias <laughs> thing. So we've been very concerned about this, and I did talk to David today, and he said that they're going to be reviewing, um, the AG's office is going to be reviewing um, some of the policies, and I don't know what will come up with this particular one, but we've been very concerned and we're thinking of going public about this because we're, this is really not good. Um, and there are, he has made some other changes that are also um, also really watering it down. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyhow, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Those are my comments. Okay. Um, any other Members of the public, who <laughs> yes, hi. Do you no. have anything to? No. Only, nope. I would just have a question, and that is, will the ultimate report out of this advisory committee be available to the public? I imagine it will go up on the website on the legislative yeah, website. So there's a, a website for the Vermont legislature that has all the reports that people submit. Okay. Um, so that will be the easiest way to find it, and hopefully, yeah. So thank you very much. Clear. Yes. Yeah. Once we get it all down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, then we're done with public commentary. That was fast. Um, next meeting. This, it's not as simple as the second Tuesday of November because if I'm, rem I, that's why I wrote this little thing after it because if I remember correctly, Commissioner Mino neither Commissioner, Menard or Monica Weebles can make that date any longer. Am I right about that? That's what it's I remember. Oh, it's the sixth. The next, the second Tuesday of November is the thirteenth. Right. So I think that's like a can of worms <laughs> in a way because this is, seems to work. I mean, everyone's kind of used to the second. Tuesday, on the other hand, someone who is statutorily supposed to be here can't. So I think I would like to just say second Tuesday and hey, David, get the <laughs> find us a place. But I don't think it's I mean, that we, simple. We do. This shouldn't necessarily change the decision, but we have already reserved the Waterbury. Uh, oh, once ago, we reserved the Waterbury oh. uh, place for both November and December. Oh, did you say Tuesday, November 13th? Well, yeah, yeah, there it goes. It has to change. But um, uh, you seem like a great <laughs> Right. I know you're doing great. You're, you're, yeah. um, sounds like an awesome idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for thinking of me. 
I'm emailing her right now. As soon as <laughs> okay. Um, I just that's why I wrote like that because we they informed Monica informed us of this at the last meeting, and so I just figured it's a can of worms because I don't know how we're going to get all of our schedules. You know, if we throw it up in the air. What other time can anyone meet? Oh, that's going to be fun. I suggest that you keep that meeting okay. and have them either follow up or send someone else. Great. Don't. Don't. For now, yeah. Okay, for now. So, well, that made that easy. I just, yeah, I sort of second, at least for the meetings where we already have rooms. Rooms. Reserved, so, so through December. Continue, um, and then maybe, but, well, yeah. Great. So... I'm not even going to take a vote, people. That's what we're doing. <laughs> okay. New business. What? That I I'm, I really want to hear where we're going next, and I don't want to dominate that discussion. I know that we just decided to not have Lisa and Menard here for the next one. The dead report is due on October 15th Oy. to the Joint Justice Oversight Committee. Um, and it's uh, it's about incarceration rates of um, people of color. And it's in, it's, and so it's a pretty, it's a pretty good report, I think, well, from what I've seen of it. So. And that'll, prop, that'll be on the agenda. Yeah. So if it's coming out on the 15th, it'll be on the agenda for next month. I mean, the 15th. It'll be available. And I think that they actually have the, the um, researcher that put it together uh, is neither Monica nor Lisa, so she could maybe come and present it. That would be, if I need the contact information for that, I and I will float, I'll yeah. float an invitation. Um, and once the report is out, if somebody can let us know so we all have it yeah. in advance of the Well, you said meeting. Lisa Menard was going to forward that to me, right? So she said that she, if you were referring to the data, okay, that um, they have that and she'd get it to you and you can disseminate it. If okay. It re if you were referring to a report, that's not done yet. Right. Data would be great. Data would be fine, I, I guess. the report just asks for the data anyway. So I think that okay. there's much more uh, you know, to can, it. Um, can you ask I mean, her if that the person put together? I figured yeah, if she can come. Sure. Yeah. 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 She's the one who presented it, so okay. it would be great. Yeah, she, her what's, her, what's her name? Do you remember? Liz. I don't remember. Her name. <laughs> <laughs> she's a relatively new uh, uh, status uh, employee. Uh, she's doing the data. Been a part of it. Oh. Yeah, I can't remember her name. Okay, so so the corrections data will come. I'll get that out to everybody, and that'll be that's one of the that's sort of upcoming. I think the, who's run for Rebecca? Rebecca. Yeah. And didn't she say that she would like to do the? I've got that. Next, yeah. I've got that. Yeah, okay. I've got Rebecca down on here. Um, Anything else? I mean, Pepper's going to work on the copy that we had for this meeting, and I will get that back out. I imagine that's probably based on you all loved what happened this meeting, so I guess that'll go really well, too, and um, be very probably a fairly quick discussion, I guess, which seems good. Um, at some point, I guess we're going to have to move on to 6B. And that, I think, is going to be a bit harder. Um, whether and how to prohibit racial profiling, including implementing any associated penalties. Um, my sense is that's a bit more tricky. I think before we do that, to back yep. up, I think was the decision that once we complete 6A, we would then submit that, or are we doing a complete thing? I, I thought we are doing it as we complete one. We're, are we... No, we were gonna. We're just doing them in. Or we're just doing okay. them in succession. So we're do it as a bunch. Is They'll live on my computer. We'll okay. put it all together. Then we'll send it. Um. Uh. Anything else that people are thinking of? We've got three items: continuing the discussion of racial, reducing racial disparity in the criminal justice system, henceforth known as reducing racial disparity. Um. Rebecca wants to present a bit on that. We've got the corrections data coming. That seems like a fairly full plate right there. Okay, so 
expect those emails. They will be coming. That was the new business. Everybody clear on what we're doing? Grand. Can I entertain a motion? To adjourn, perhaps? <laughs> Judge I'll make, Garrison. A, I'll make a motion. Yeah. Anyone else want to second that? Second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? We are adjourned. See you all next month on the 13th in Waterbury. Thank you.